Hi, everyone, and welcome to our event tonight. My name is John Clinton with Penguin Random House, and I have just a few housekeeping items to touch on before I turn things over to tonight's fantastic speakers. Um, at the first uh, meeting of the How Have I Not Read This Virtual Book Club. First of all, we're excited to be working with legendary San Francisco bookstore City Lights on this event and encourage you to order a copy of The Plague from them if you have not already. As a reminder, please keep your audio and video muted throughout the session. If you would like to submit questions, you can email them to our virtual inbox. Um, I will be reminding you uh, in the chat of what the email address uh, to submit questions uh, is. And the chat, by the way, can be activated by clicking the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. You can also comment along and of course, show appreciation for our speakers as you see fit throughout in that same chat. Now for the best viewing experience, um, for those of you not familiar with Zoom, if you're on a computer, we suggest finding the gallery view button, which is in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom window. Once in gallery view, if you hover over any of the black tiles with a name on it, you should see a blue ellipsis, that's the three little dots. Click on this and find hide non-video participants. This should clear up your screen so you only see me right now. If you're on a mobile device, you can swipe left to access gallery view and you can toggle non-video participants by tapping more and going into your meeting settings. I think doing this is definitely helpful because then you will only see our speakers once they come out onto the digital stage. And I'm gonna ask them to do that right now. So Laura, Emily, and Alice, please unmute your audio and start your video. While they're getting settled, I'll mention that Alice Kaplan is Sterling Professor and Chair of the Department of French at Yale University. Her most recent book, Looking for the Stranger, Albert, Albert Camus and the Life of a Literary Classic, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her prefaces for Camus' personal writings and committed writings will be published in those editions from Vintage Books in August. Emily St. John Mandel's most recent novel, The Glass Hotel, is currently at the top of bestseller lists nationwide. Her four previous novels include Station Eleven, a finalist for the National Book Award and the Penn Faulkner Award, and itself one of our best looks at humanity before and after a pandemic. Laura Maris is a writer and translator. She teaches creative writing at the University of Buffalo and is currently at work on a new translation of Albert Camus' The Plague to be published by Knopf next year. So with all of that, I will now turn things over to our speakers. Great. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to talk about this book that has sort of uh, crashed into our lives, um, as one of our friends said recently. Um, so we thought that we might start by just um, telling the story of kind of when we all first read The Plague and, and what that was like and, and what it's like to reread it now. Um, maybe Alice, if you'd like to start. Sure. I can't tell you how many times I've read The Plague. I mean, I've been teaching it maybe for 20 years, and I just never thought I would be teaching The Plague during a plague. I never thought I'd have to give a trigger warning to my students. Uh, in fact, I first started worrying about it in the fall because one of my students had family in Wuhan. Um, but by the time I actually got to the novel, we were remote. and. I could just see my students as little screen, little postage stamps on the screen, and it was really very moving to be teaching it now. Well, I think I first read The Plague a million years ago in my early 20s, and I didn't really retain it that well. You know, sometimes you'll read a book years and years ago, and it just kind of recedes into this haze of red books. So then I reread it over the past couple of weeks for this event. And I have to say, I found it really difficult to read. Um, and, you know, I'm curious if anybody else had that experience. But, yeah, I, I think particularly... Um, what I found really hard was reading about the dread of the approaching plague, you know, which we had also mm -hmm. recently experienced firsthand. And that was something that had frankly never really occurred to me about a plague. You know, I think I'd always sort of thought of it in terms of you're in a pandemic or you're not in a pandemic. Huh. But the dread of the approach felt so intense in New York with the coronavirus. And um, I feel like something that Camus really captured in an incredible way was the sort of denial and 
the knowing, but also not knowing, you know, sort of telling yourself it's going to be fine, even as it's moving across the country toward you. And you know, intellectually that of course it's coming. So yeah, I was fascinated by that. Um, I don't know that I'd recommend reading this book right now, which I realize is the worst possible thing to say in a book club for the book, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was tough going, honestly. <laughs> what was your experience with that, Laura? <laughs> um, well, no, I, well, it's, it's really interesting that you say that because um, not only have I been, been reading this book, but I just started translating this book in September and never imagined that these were the circumstances under which I would be translating it. Um, so, I've been really deep. I've been really deep in this book, uh, in my own professional life. And then, you know, to have it happening in all of our lives, um, it, it felt very strange. You know, it's like you usually work is a real place of refuge for me. Um, but in this case, you know, I felt like every time that I was holding the book, every time I was looking at translations, I was kind of looking at the world in this, um, kind of through the lens of the book, as if the book had become some kind of mirror magnifying glass um so that's been very strange and and you know um it's never happened to me before when i'm translating something where i'm kind of moving at the pace of words and sentences and then i find that what's happening in the world is somehow moving at that pace as well um so what you said about dread i think I, it really speaks to to what it's been like um because Kimu is kind of a master of, of describing these uncertain times. Um, and, and it can feel too close, um, but it can also feel like um, somebody's guiding you, I think, in a weird way. <laughs> um, but yeah, Alice, do you have that yeah, feeling? Yeah, I can student? just report on my students' response, in fact, was not traumatized, particularly but they were impatient when the book didn't completely correspond to their experience. So I found myself having to choose between what Cameron intended, you know, the world of the, the Nazi occupation that really inspired him, and then what we're getting from the book today. So the students would say, well, there's no social distancing in this world. Why are they all going to cafes? You know, why are they all, we can't, we can't go out, you know, why there's no confinement in this book. And I think it's because during the Nazi occupation, of course, you know, entertainment was one of the scandals of the occupation that entertainment went on unabated. And he was trying to get at that in his allegory. But of course, his allegory succeeded so well that we've forgotten the key to it. We've forgotten that it's about the occupation. And it really is. I mean, one of my students said, I feel like this is documentary. It doesn't feel like fiction. Mm -hmm. and it's yeah. interesting reading this. Um, you know, I hadn't read very much about the book before I came back to the book. So about halfway through, I was looking up some articles and it was sort of surprising to me that it was allegory. Um, I was the last person to know that. But you know, it seemed to me that it read as a pretty straightforward account of an actual plague. Mm -hmm. Although I did have the same mm -hmm. questions about why people were gathering in large groups. <laughs> um, you know, that, that seems silly. Um, until yeah. there's this epic speech, it's like six pages long from his friend uh, Taru um, toward the end. And I almost mm -hmm. felt like, like, I don't know, do you guys feel like Camus kind of like felt compelled to put that in? Like, just in case you guys thought that this was actually about a plague. It's like, uh -huh. that's the is first time it seemed clearly allegorical. Father and capital punishment or is it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, well, Alice, you can speak to this as well. But um, for me, that's, that's sort of Camus reflect, refracting himself into all of these different characters. So there's a little bit of, oh, hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> Hello, sweetheart. <laughs> Alice and Laura. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, you may see some of Camus kind of in the journalist. You may see some of him in um, the doctor. You know, you may see some of his experience in Teru because Camus was certainly um, an advocate against that kind of punishment. Um, so yeah, it, it, yeah. Um, I mean, people say it, that I'll give you the the scholarly footnote that Taru is based on a man named Pascal Pia, who was Camus' mentor, 
and the man who hired him at Alger Républicain in the 1930s. And Pascal Pia was this really uncompromising guy. I mean, he wouldn't take any flack from anybody. So, you know, the anger of that character at his father and so on, it's very reminiscent of, of Pascal Pia. And Camus loved, and then they actually had a big falling out uh, at Kumba, his post-war newspaper. But yeah, I mean, Camus will often, you know, the death penalty shows up in almost every one of his novels. Uh, he always has to, I think he really saw the post-war world as a place where um, civilizations would have to deal with, would have to abolish the death penalty. It was his number one priority. Mm -hmm. right. So it maybe fits a little awkwardly in there. Right, yeah. It's I, funny I guess to me. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, um, I was wondering if you had the same feeling about the speech as you do about the, the scene where with the old man who, who spits on the cats outside his window. Because um, Camus has these kind of amazing little detours. Um, and, you know, they always mean something. They, they're full of meaning. But um, I feel like that speech and the the scene with the cats are also ways that he avoids kind of, he builds suspense with them um, to kind of avoid having things happen too fast. But um, obviously they're very different <laughs> um, emotionally how they feel. Um, but right. yeah, I don't know. As a novelist, what was your feeling about the way he kind of moves the plot? Um, were you impatient yeah. with that or? <laughs> um, I wasn't impatient because there was that sense of dread, which benefits from a certain slowness, which I thought, um, which I thought worked really well. But, you know, my, uh, it's impossible for me not to evaluate it as a novel. And, mm -hmm. and that speech I just mentioned yeah. toward the end, that kind of stood out to me as, uh, you know, and here is the authorial message. And it was like, oh, come on. You know? <laughs> right? but, well, you know, that was a really interesting question, which is why Camus decided not to reveal the identity of the narrator until the very last pages of the book. And I've always found that quite fun in teaching the book to ask the students when they figured out who the narrator was. I suppose I don't have to do a spoiler alert here about who the narrator was. <laughs> right. Okay. Knows. But, and Camus himself was really ambivalent. He couldn't figure out whether this was like something he was really committed to or whether it was this hokey trick that was working mm -hmm. too well and making his book into a bestseller. But I, I think there's a really beautiful reason why he doesn't give the identity. And I didn't understand that until the coronavirus, which is Mm -hmm. He wanted somebody talking about the plague that spoke for everybody. He didn't want somebody just telling their own little selfish story of confinement and what was happening to them. And mm -hmm. I really think we need somebody to narrate what's going on right now. I, I just felt that we need a Dr. Ryu. I'm asking myself, you know, I listened to Cuomo. Hmm, is he the Dr. Ryu? Is he the one that can speak for the people? Yeah, I thought of well, Cuomo think, as soon as you um, said that. Did you? Yeah. Did you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's super interesting. And I think what you say, Alice, is really beautiful. Um, I was on a call on Sunday on a Zoom event like this. Um, it was a program for Columbia's program in narrative medicine. So it was a call with 45 doctors reading the plague right now as their book club book. And um, one of them said exactly that, you know, that the, the voice of Rhea is kind of the voice of this collective trauma um, yeah. and that we need something like that. And um, I think, yeah, you kind of have to acknowledge it in this moment. Um, it, it's, I, I still don't totally know what it means to try to translate a voice like that, but um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's definitely, you know, Camus working on the sentence level and on the using the kind of structures that are available to him to make um, make a voice that doesn't put him, the author, his experience sort of in the foreground um, somehow. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure after the war, people were listening to de Gaulle all the time, taking the power and Camus was thinking, no, we don't want de Gaulle to be the one to narrate the experience of the war. We mm. need a 
different. We need a different voice. Um, I have a question for you, Emily, because oh, sure. I read Station Eleven um, as I was thinking about the plague and thinking about Camus, and there's so many things I, I love about it. The, and, and the differences with the plague, that in your world, the plague, that the, the pandemic has come and gone and destroyed the entire civilization. In Camus' The Plague, you think it's a time-limited horror and it's going to end, and it does end in a way at the end. But in your world, people have museums where they keep the detritus of the civilization. And um, I wanted to ask you a question, which is, you start your novel with that scene in the theater where the actor dies. And I couldn't help but think about the scene in The Plague of Orpheus in Eurydice where the actor dies on stage and the people don't know if that's meant to happen in the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, or in fact, the actor has the plague and dies. And I wondered if that was an inspiration for you or if it's a coincidence. I wish I could say it was an inspiration, but it was a coincidence. You know, I, um, I often have these that's moments amazing. where somebody will suggest something like that, and I'll think, if I took credit for this, it would make me seem really smart. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was sheer coincidence. Um, somewhere oh. I'd come across an anecdote about an actor dying of a heart attack on stage in the fourth yeah. act of King Lear. And, um, mm. and yeah, so I'd always had that idea as the opener for a novel. It's and a great know, opening. Cameron yeah, puts it in the middle of his yeah. But you, right. you use it as the structuring moment for the whole plot with that character. Well, thank you. Um, but yeah, you know, the plague kind of highlighted things that I just didn't think about when I was writing Station Eleven, which, you know, I just mentioned earlier, the dread. I, I just, that just hadn't occurred to me. Like, I just sort of thought of it as, thought of a pandemic as something that's just kind of there or not there. Um, well, yeah, your so, characters die so quickly. They do, yeah. And, and something else, which is maybe more coronavirus related than plague related. I didn't need to make the mortality rate nearly that high for civilization to collapse. <laughs> you know, I, um, I wouldn't have guessed that a mortality rate as low, and this is not to minimize the horror of our present moment, as low as the mortality rate seems to be for COVID-19. I wouldn't have guessed that that would cause such a profound disruption in our lives. Um, yeah, so that was a little overstated in Station Eleven in retrospect. Oh no, it was not. <laughs> it was Thank you. Not. It's still with me. So we're getting all these questions. All right. um, um, does someone yeah. want to take one? Well, I think the first one is for you, Alice. Um, well, that's true. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll I'll take that, Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Uh, you want to know how I teach the plague and what aspects of the book I focus on. So this year, especially since we're reading it in the middle of an epidemic, I try to get the students to think about what Camus himself wanted to transmit, as well as what they're experiencing as they read the book. Um, and I think in, the, in a course on the modern French novel, it helps them think about, you know, how much literary history is important versus the life of a book and the way this book, the plague is the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, every time something awful happens, people can read the plague through that disaster. So I do a lot of history of World War II and the occupation and Camus and the resistance, the spirit of the resistance. I talk about the themes of separation and exile and resistance. Uh, we look at descriptions of rats, because I've always thought that the rats in the plague are really kind of comic characters who twirl around like cartoon characters. They're not realistic. So since we've read so much realist fiction in the course, we talk about what realism is and did Camus intend realism or did he intend something more like a myth? Um, and you know, the various key scenes, I mean, so many people years later remember the swimming scene from the plague, you know, that great scene of bonding between two men. Of course, we talk about the absence of women in the novel. We talk about the absence of Arabs in the novel in Oran. That's just a start. Right. Yeah, the absence yeah. of women was striking to me. Um, I don't need gender parity to like a novel, but 
wow, that guy couldn't deal with women. <laughs> I was kind of amazed. Um, you know, when there are like three of them, but one's off stage and sending telegrams and the others are sometimes described as shadows. I was like, wow, there's a, there's a lot going on here. Well, yeah. I think not to defend Camus because I, I can see that. I think that's offensive to certain students too. Um, he was separated from his wife. He was in France and she was in Al Oran. It was, she was actually in Algiers. It was after the Nazis had invaded um, North, Af I mean, the Allies had liberated North Africa. So he couldn't even write her a letter for two years, but it was reversed because he was in France and she was in Algeria. And he was really keen on writing a book about separation and the form of separation that that troubled him the most was the separation of couples. So yeah. he wrote in his notebook that this the title of the plague could have been the separated. Um, oh wow! So <laughs> yeah, that certainly resonates in the present moment. Um, you know, my family's all in British Columbia, and I'm in New York, wow. and so many people are in this position where there's just no way of knowing when we'll be getting on airplanes again. Yeah. Yeah, that horrible yeah. sense of not seeing people we love and not being able to touch them. And I mean, it's so, it's so physical. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, one of the strange really... things about teaching right now, too, is like one student will be in Shanghai, you know, who's gotten home and is some, in some strange time zone and another one in California. And it's just unreal. Yeah, and I mean, it's, I think also, you know, the separation for Camus, I mean, he, he sort of, I think, to write about something so big as the Nazi occupation of France, like, I think he's kind of struggling with the line between wanting to write about his own experience, because it's kind of his historical account, it's what he knows, and it would feel disingenuous to to not bring that in, but then also not wanting to try to like speak for everybody or put himself uh, too much in the forefront. Um, so I think kind of dividing himself up between all these characters, it does, it, it's not a defense of how many men there are, but it might be some of the rationale behind it. <laughs> right, it's interesting. Yeah, and I have no problem with all those men, but it's, um, it was just really striking to me that there weren't yes, any women, you know, like no nurses in the hospitals. Yeah. Like it was, yeah. It was really hard. unusual. And it's one of the things that may, has made it really hard to adapt for cinema. Oh, interesting. So mm -hmm. when an Argentine filmmaker made a version of it that was kind of set in Argentina, uh, the Junta in Argentina, he made Rambert into a woman, played oh, by wow. Sandrine Bonnet. So the, the journalist is a woman. I mean, you just couldn't, you couldn't, you can't have a movie without any women. It just right. doesn't work. Right. Emily, well, you've got a where... question from Jessica. Laura, Let's I mean. You have oh. A question from Jessica. Or oh. no, Emily. This is for Emily, Emily but I think we answered, think we, we kind of answered. Yeah. Um, but there's another yeah. one, a question from Richard. Um, Camus credo appears more than once in the book. There are more things to admire in men than to despise and feels like a lifeline in real time of the plague. Um, do you agree? I wonder what you all think of that idea. Um, yeah. There are more things to admire in men than to despise. I think from my perspective, the way I see him uh, uh, approaching that is um, in part, like through the speech, the human crisis that he gave um, right before this book came out in the U.S., um, where I think you can kind of watch that speech, and it's online if you want to watch it. Um, you can watch that speech um, in comparison with this book, and it sort of takes the politics of this moment in the book, um, makes it a little more clear. Um, but I also think that Camus really loved like human. Um, the idea of, of immunity of the herd um, as a metaphor for how you kind of culturally cope with um, a, a crisis and and for him like the idea that there are more things in men uh, to admire than to despise by the way that will be uh, humans in my translation <laughs> um, but uh, it, it really feels like a kind of um, to me, a reference to the way that we can kind of develop uh, immune resistance and cultural immune resistance to forces of darkness in our world. 
That's a really interesting I'm really idea. I'm curious what others of you think about that. <laughs> no, I love that, that idea. question. I, I took the, the sort I mean, of bio art take, but there are many others. Yeah, no, that's great. That's an original theory about this novel that I hope you write about. Um, I do think he tries to keep up a double idea, one that there's more to admire than to despise, but the other is that the plague bacillus never goes away. It's always hiding and ready to come out. And that plague bacillus is the evil, the shadow within us. So he's both optimistic and really pessimistic about humankind. Right. I think I am too. I was trying to think of where I fall on that question. And um, yeah, both. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot to admire and a lot to despise. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah, could change uh, the language to a lot to admire and a lot to despise. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, there's a question for you, Emily, from Steve um, about struggles in rereading it. Um, what kind of strategies can we use to better grasp the thoughts in his words? Um. You know, I'm not sure. I, I feel like I'm possibly the least qualified person on this panel to answer that question. Um, for me, it's always just, I suppose, the same strategies as I'd have for any sort of anything I was close reading, which is just to read slowly and take notes. But yeah, that, that's not the most profound answer I've ever given in my life. It's a hard question. It it's a hard it's question. <laughs> we, and it's a personal question. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 The um, thoughts and words, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that there, you know, um, I think it's important to point out, too, that Camus wasn't just writing about illness as kind of a pretext. Um, so I think, you know, it's kind of strange to imagine this, this that during a plague that, you know, we have all these metaphors for war. Um, people are talking about in the news, like the invisible enemy and all this stuff. And then, you know, during um, a war, Camus chose to use the metaphor of a plague. So there's this kind of two way street of metaphor happening. Um, but I think it's also really important that Camus was very sick when he was writing this. Um, so illness was not entirely metaphorical. Um, he, you know, he had tuberculosis mm -hmm. and he was recovering from a pretty serious relapse of it when he was writing this. Um, so the difficulty in reading it is perhaps due to the fact that he, he doesn't just make illness sort of a, a metaphor, an allegory. Um, there was something at stake for him in that. <laughs> right. That's interesting. Portrayal. Yeah. Yeah, he's so committed to the brutality of illness in this book. Um, that scene where the child dies, I have to confess, I yeah. skimmed a couple of pages there. It was just like, you know what? I, I have a four-year-old who you all just met. Like, I can't, I can't. <laughs> so, yeah, I was, um, yeah. there was something so visceral about that experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of his real qualities, going back to the thoughts and the words, it's not thoughts for me. That's not Camus' major quality as a writer. It's images. And he said at one point, if you want to be a philosopher, make images. And that's what I find mm. so beautiful in his writing. I love that. <laughs> um, I love a question I just spied in the chat. Um, could we speak to the significance of Grand writing and rewriting the beginning lines of his novel? Um, Emily, I'm really curious how that struck you, first of all. <laughs> oh, as writers, we've all been there, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I kind of loved that detail. It, I think as uh, not just a novelist, as any writer, it's really easy to lose sight of the forest for the trees, you know, and find yourself thinking, if I can just perfect X, where X equals a chapter or a sentence or an individual word, then it will all fall into place. And it's like, no, you just got to finish the draft and then worry about <laughs> fixing it, in my experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And for full disclosure, I don't know anything about your writing practice. <laughs> I did not mean that. To no, that no, it's, a, it's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my approach is I to love... just wing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
like we're doing I think now. it's yeah. a sign of um I think it's a sign of Graham's uh he's he's just starting out as a writer and that he feels like he has to perfect his first sentence before yeah. he can write another yeah, one. the first novel is rough you gotta get through <laughs> no, that he really, he really is my he's my favorite character I think because he's got this obsessive problem with his sentence and he's so abandoned by his wife and but he's also he's really effective in fighting the plague he turns out to be one of the really most important person people but in a totally non-heroic non-showy way and i think Camus uses him to push against a conventional idea of heroism that's really effective yeah. i yeah. love that idea that's great. But if we could just write and rewrite our sentences, <laughs> there's something. Um, it's definitely that's, less that's of a, a sign of hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, Kenner had a lot of trouble with the plague. I mean, he wrote The Stranger in six weeks. Oh, wow. He wrote The Plague in seven years. Yikes. And he was so busy with the resistance and he was becoming famous, so he had all these interruptions and he really did have a grand like experience in some ways. I mean, entire characters disappeared and um, things got rewritten again and again. Right. My drafts are like that. Characters disappear, <laughs> things get rewritten. <laughs> so, yeah. um, there's a question here from Jen that I really like. Um, have any of you found your reading or writing habits have been affected by this whole quarantine situation? Oh, wow. Great question. Mm. Um, I, mine, well, I'm I'm in a sort of strange spot. Um, I think the, the the first time that I really felt like uh, my work had something to do with what was happening in the world in this crisis was when the quarantine was declared in Wuhan. Um, so uh, the quarantine here, the quarantine there, it it, it sort of you know it's it's like the moment in the book when all of a sudden that telegram comes and it's like declare a state of plague close the city i mean i think quarantines are are the moment when you really feel like oh my god um you know life has taken a completely unexpected turn um so but my own personal writing and translating practice um i had a, i had a lot of deadlines lined up before all this happened so i've been doing my best to meet them um and it's been it's been hard um but uh it feels really good to be able to write something when i am able um maybe it's the grand in me <laughs> um, to be able to put down a sentence it feels really good i don't know about the two of you how about you emily well i have a four-year-old um this is a sort of brave new world with zero childcare. And that's been a real logistical challenge, to put it very mildly. Um, I you know, can only imagine. <laughs> I, was, I was used to having about six hours a day to work. And now, you know, me and my husband are just sort of frantically juggling childcare and our work all day. So, yeah, now it's more like three ish you know, steal a little time here and there, put her in front of a Disney movie. Um, yeah, so it's been logistically very challenging, but I'll echo what you said, you know, in the moments when I can find my way to my work, it feels so good. It's, it's amazing to have the, um, that sort of, you know, I think, I think it was you, Laura, who referred to your work earlier as a kind of refuge or like a haven. Um, it's incredible to be able to slip into that, you know, into the project of a new novel when I can. So, I don't know. I suppose the rosiest view of it is that it makes those moments more precious than, you know, than they might have been. But uh, yeah, wow. Parenting with no childcare and writing is a thing. It really shows up a lot of the societal problems, doesn't it? It does. Things yeah. that were already wrong, you know, with our mm -hmm. culture. That there's no, there's no childcare. It's all worse. Yeah. And I've been yeah. feeling... I just add the kind of soul crushing uh, effects of Zoom. I, in my job in the university, I'll, I'll sometimes have days with four or five hours of different Zoom meetings. And I find at the end of it, I'm, I'm just, there's a verb in French, les civets. I've been through, I've been in the laundry, you know, I'm just right. <laughs> Out. And again, thank was, you for bringing that I back to me. It was end of semester moment. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I also feel like <laughs> my counsel. last class is Thursday. Wish me yeah, right, right. <laughs> a great consolation um, in writing. Oh, I just read something really interesting about that phenomenon where we're all exhausted at the end of our Zoom calls. Yeah. And uh, this, this writer made the argument that, you know, we think it's because we're presenting ourselves on video, which is a new skill, and you're monitoring different points in the screen, and it's kind of exhausting. This writer's idea was that maybe our exhaustion stems more from a sense of mourning for a lost world that Zoom reminds sure. us that we can't come together in person. And I don't know, I think there might be something to that. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. funny, when I was reading Station Eleven, I felt a great sense of comfort from the novel. And I think because that's one of your themes is the sense of a lost world and, and the longing yeah. for that world and being able to feel the sadness. I think it's really yeah. important to feel right now. I think I so. felt that too reading your book. I really oh, did. Thank you. Um you like there's something about um writing aftermath. I mean in the plague we get so little aftermath. Like we just get a little bit. Um and in that moment, you know, it's the descriptions of the sky, the weather are so beautiful that we get this sense of hope, but at the same time, like the narrator by the end of the book has lost so much. Um, so I think your novel comforts me <laughs> about, you know, the regenerative aspects of something like this more than the plague probably does. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> it's strange that in a way your novel is more optimistic, I guess when those little lights go on, when there, there's a town and far away that's found power again. It's just right. an incredible moment. Well, thank you. I think that comes down to the timeline. Um, I very purposefully set most of the action of Station 11, 15, and then 20 years after the, the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. which makes a difference. I mean, yeah, I think if you set it in the immediate aftermath or during, you know, as the plague was, then that would be an incredibly dark book um but yeah it's interesting to imagine the new world you know what comes after the calamity and kind of after the period of recovery mm -hmm. that was that was my focus and i have to say like in our present moment i do find myself thinking ahead which is maybe optimistic in itself to how the world changes after this um i mean i don't know how many authors will go on book tours again to be honest, um, you know, now that we're all kind of used to doing Zoom, <laughs> which to be clear, I would much <laughs> prefer to do this in person, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly cheaper. Um, yeah, and you know, will we still shake hands during flu season? Like, why did we think that was a good idea? <laughs> yeah, I wonder I about cultural so. change. <laughs> yeah, I, I get worn out. I mean, you talked about the tiredness of kind of being on Zoom and the uncertainty and the dread, the way that wears us out. I get exhausted with speculating about the future. Um, I really, wow. I mean, it's, it's exhausting for, I, at the, at the beginning of this crisis, I kept thinking about it and, and I don't know, there's something about like the, in the momentness of the plague that, um, is comforting to me, even if other aspects of the novel are right. not as comforting. Um, but we have some really good questions. Um, there's one, uh, there's a question about spitting on the cats, which we did mention. Um, I don't know if we want to go further to down about the spitting on the, it's one of my favorite absurd moments in the book. Um, this kind of little ecological sign that things are wrong. Um, but the <laughs> next question uh, from Sonia, uh, could you speak about the topic of solidarity among the characters in the fight against the plague or the absurd? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Alice, you're welcome to start with that one. <laughs> you might well, be the best qualified. I mean, the absurd, you know, the great Camusian category of the absurd, I think that just to say it simply, the absurd is that people die and there's nothing you can do about it. That's Camus, you know, from the time he was 17 and he was diagnosed with tuberculosis and he went from being this free kid running around playing soccer to having to have his lung punctured to rest it. They told him he was probably wouldn't last very long. So he's really haunted by that. And 
it's not like the Sartrean absurd that has a lot to do with getting along with other people. For, for Camus, it's just that nature presents you with something against which you can do nothing. Um, he talks about yeah. the tender indifference of the world in The Stranger is a line that I really love. And so in the plague, I think one of the ways you sense the absurd is when you see people dying, who dies and who lives. There's no logic to it. Uh, one of the questions asks about Panelu dying and they say it's a doubtful case. And that's, I think he was trying to complicate his own game that he was playing about who died. I mean, why does, why does mm -hmm. Taru die, you know? And why does, why does uh, Rambert live? Um, that's the absurd. And we're seeing that so much right now. It's just yeah. crazy. We are actually seeing patterns now in who dies having to do with social inequality. So it's a little different. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and the, uh, the asthma patient in the play, you know, he's this sort of red herring character in that vein where you think, oh, that guy's going to be the first to go. You know, he's bedridden and he has asthma. And I, no, he makes it through. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. He's the fate. He's, he's the it's fate. Absurd. He's the fate of the yeah. book. He's yeah. the person with the scissors, you know. Right. He's like a demigod. <laughs> yeah. Counting the chickpeas <laughs> from pan to pan. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could just see him making a list of his characters and figure, figuring out who he was going to kill and who right. he was going to kill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, off-the-cuff recommendation for Camus notebooks during this period, which are fabulous. Um, I'm going to look for and them. If you're if they're really good. Um, yeah, he, he kind of lays out some of the strategy behind those characters. Um, oh, Jillian has a question Let's... about translation challenges specific to the plague versus other mm. books um, mm. that we've translated. Um, I mean, for me, the challenge, the, the most difficult parts about translating the plague are um, capturing Camus' restraint. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to find places where maybe the existing translation is a little less restrained than what Camus wrote and kind of dial it back to that um, really beautiful, like almost like lyric poetry quality of some of those moments. Um, so he, Kim is kind of a master taking what's quiet and putting the emphasis on it so that it becomes really kind of louder and more, um, kind of a testament to human resilience, you know, so there's this moment in, in big where he, um, where he basically says they got back to work, you know, right after the swimming scene, Teru and Rhea, there's a moment where it basically says like they got back to work and the Stuart Gilbert translation is like they put their shoulders to the wheel. <laughs> you know? So that was probably that's the experience of reading that moment. Um, that's what you want to be feeling. Um, but I got to make the prose that inspires that experience rather than trying to write that experience onto the page where it doesn't exist. Um, so that's been one of the translation challenges. Um, and also just that the separated lovers really kind of pull their their seams um you can feel the longing in them um and they're hard they're hard to translate um it's hard to fit all of that into a an english sentence so i have my work cut out for me <laughs> i don't I know Alice, say in your that one When I teach, I get very frustrated with Stuart Gilbert because he's always paraphrasing and that's the great sin in translation. You're not supposed to explain the language. You're supposed to find the equivalent. And that's why I'm so excited, Laura, to be able to teach your translation. I mean, every time I come to that, put his shoulder to the wheel or also a kind of blindness to North African culture because Kemu really was immersed in the life in Oran, in that city. And so, Stuart Gilbert has the guy counting green peas and it's chickpeas, you know, it's gotta be chickpeas. So, yeah. yeah. But I don't know, Emily, if you notice anything about kind of Camus sentences that um, you wouldn't, that you, you would revise in your own work or um, if there are moments that you kind of uh, have, have thoughts about the way he, he alternates his style so uh, kind of aggressively, 
between more philosophical stuff and and kind of more like reporting the day-to-day kind of liked that um sometimes if a book is too consistent i find it can kind of lull me and i start missing stuff um i found mm-hmm. it kind of effective like i liked when he switched into the sort of reportage style you know and then we look at so and so's notebooks for an account the following days like that kind of thing it was like oh right thank you for reminding me there's this uh you know this invisible narrator here <laughs> um yeah I, I actually enjoyed that yeah do you have favorite um, scenes each of you favorite scenes in the novel the swimming scene that was that was really kind of beautiful and i don't know i don't know how much of that was colored for me by how many accounts I've read about people working on the front lines now of this pandemic, where, you know, as I was reading the scene of the two men there, it was hard not to think about the people in the ER who just did 18 hours, you know, with the same mask. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the accounts that I've read of their incredible exhaustion, both physical and emotional. um, Yeah, I found myself kind of mapping that on to that, that moment. And it, I think it kind of made it, uh, it made it resonate more for me, I guess. I yeah. Agree. Um, my fa- one of my favorite scenes is the spitting on the cat. Um, it's just so fantastic and weird. Uh, also love the swimming scene. <laughs> um, and I love, um, I love the scene at the train station, um, when everyone is reunited. Um, yeah. and, Rumbert kind mm-hmm. of describes like this woman running into him and he's not e- he thinks it's the woman that he loves but he's not even sure and he doesn't even care um because he's just kind of immersed in that moment um so I love that <laughs> yeah Alice do you have a favorite yeah. scene after all these years <laughs> I love the lot. I love the ending I just think Camus is so good at endings and the, uh, that he gives this little moral lesson in the ending, but he does it so delicately. And he names the places where the plague bacillus could hide. And right. it includes paper. And you just think Paperwork. about the bureaucracy, evil <laughs> right, bureaucracy. Right. Too. Um, yeah. Uh, also, this is it's, pretty- It is resonant now, you know, where right. we're all obsessed with, well, do we need to like wash off our Amazon package with Lysol? <laughs> Yeah, I put all my packages in quarantine for 48 hours before I bring them upstairs, which I know is excessive, but it's New York. I mean, you know, and going to the gas station, like taking your Lysol and, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 And another one of my favorite scenes, it's so gruesome and horrible, but that scene in the theater where the actor collapses on stage. Yeah. That was a yeah. scene. That was one of the scenes of the book where I could see it. You know, the ladies' mm-hmm. fans and scarves abandoned on seats. Like just that. Again, it was just yeah. so visually vivid to me. Yeah, and we actually we went to that theater. Oh wow! Um, in Oran, yeah. Oran um, and went it, to, it's like another world, doesn't it? When we went to Oran, yeah. At Christmas. I mean, it was like four months ago. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. The lost anyway, world. Four um, months ago. <laughs> It was like a lost world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the theater, you can totally imagine where those characters were sitting. Um, and you can see the whole, like the red velvet seats and just this absolutely crazy, like kind of art deco, maybe art, more art nouveau lobby with these paintings of naked women. And you can you can totally imagine how absurd that scene really was in Kim's mind. Um, but yeah. It was amazing, in fact, for this. This book that's supposed to be an allegory, how much very real description there is of neighborhoods in that city, the Spanish neighborhood with the low lying houses where some of the poor characters live and Mm -hmm. why he chose Mm -hmm. that. Did he spend a lot of time there? Back to Algeria. Um, So he grew up in Algiers um, and as the child of a very poor family, um, and then he married his wife, her family was from Oran. Um, so he was spending the early years of the war in Oran, uh, living in an, in an apartment that was from her in-laws, which he hated. <laughs> um, right. they, there was not a whole lot of love between uh, Kim <laughs> and uh, his in-laws. Um, so I, I should put in a, he, plug, a plug for the essay, Stopping in Oran 
in the new volume oh, yeah. of Personal Right. It's so good. He wrote it. It's full of his bad feelings about Oran. He used a lot of the details in the plague. But um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> he wanted to visit a plague on his in-laws there's something beautifully passive aggressive about that i love it <laughs> it was not lost on him i think <laughs> um but i think yeah the the kind of um beginnings the kind of seed of the plague the novel is sort of in that essay um in a really interesting way if you're interested in sort of how these texts develop uh, in a writer's mind um, that essay is really cool um so we're we coming question or yeah we're about ready to wrap up here the last yeah. questions um there's one question about uh Rambert's change of mind in leaving the town um which i think is maybe we could end on that note um his decision not to exit um it's uh it's kind of a beautiful i think it's a kind of a beautiful decision when uh rambert says like i have to leave for love and ria of course no epidemiologist would want this no public health person would want this but ria says if if you have to leave for love then i won't stand in your way um <laughs> and uh <laughs> There's something kind of um, maybe another fragment of Camus' own life in that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know if there's there's kind of a more allegorical reading of that. I think, you know, allegory can be too strict sometimes. Uh, Camus wanted to create like a living, breathing book, um, even though there's allegorical elements. And I think Rambert's desire to leave is maybe part of that. Um, but yeah. Okay, hi. Fun um, to, uh, hi. Fun to talk to you. Yeah, just just coming hi. back to to thank thank you all for uh, for being here and doing this and the and the great discussion. Um, sorry, I hope I didn't I didn't cut anybody off. You had any final thoughts to share? No, no, I don't think so. No. Great. So I'll just say then thank you to Emily, to Alice, to Laura. Um, this has been such a fun conversation. You all managed to make talking about the plague kind of fun. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone at City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco for co-producing this event. Um, and thank you to everyone watching. You've been a great audience. And remember, you can find all of these, um, everyone's catalogs, past, present, and future at bookshop.org. Um, tonight has, of course, been the inaugural meeting of the How Have I Not Read This Book Club. Um, because you're here with us now, you get to learn about our next selection before the rest of the world. And I'm going to queue up a little visual that has been shared with me. Um, and here it is. Uh, so we are uh, thrilled to begin reading Jennifer Egan's Pulitzer Prize and National Book Critics Circle award-winning novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, which Entertainment Weekly recently named the best book of the decade. And we'll be joined for a live virtual discussion on June 4th with Jennifer Egan herself uh, and musician Michelle Zahner. Our bookselling partner for this next selection will be Brooklyn's Greenlight Bookstore. So we hope you'll order a copy from Greenlight and read along with us at hashtag how have I not read this? And then sign up, of course, to be part of the event on our Eventbrite page. So that's all for now. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks to all the speakers, and have a great night. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. Thank you yeah. so much. It was a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Definitely. It was really fun. We'll meet in person. Everyone. I'd love to. Yeah. All right. Take Bye. care, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Bye.